So thank very much for coming back and not going uh, to the sea, <laughs> uh, since we have uh, such a hot day today. Uh, also, I want to thank really the, uh, the panelists that just uh, spoke before. We really went into a great conversation that was leading, I would say, really well on this panel. Uh, since uh, now we are going to speak about uh, AI for the people, AI bias, uh, ethics and the common good. Uh, so I'm very happy to introduce uh, our moderator and then she will introduce our great panelist, uh, Nicole Shepard. Uh, she is an independent researcher, consultant and freelance writer. She takes an international feminist perspective on tech related topics uh, like the politics of data and algorithm, surveillance, online harassment, privacy and the diversity. Thank you, Tatiana. And now that we have lights and screens back, I'll just briefly introduce our two speakers. Um, to my right, we have Maya Ganesh. She's a feminist technology researcher, and also a speaker and writer who works across academia and industry and NGOs. She very recently joined the Kim Research Group at Karlsruhe University of Arts and Design as a research coordinator. Um, that is the AI and media philosophy research group where she works on a project about AI and the society of the future. She's also pursuing her own PhD at Leuphana University in Lüneburg. Her project there examines the interaction of computational techniques with cultural narratives in the construction of machine autonomy, AI and the evolving role of the human in all of that. Her work specifically um, engages with computational approaches to AI ethics and in the case of autonomous vehicles. Previously, she's worked with Tactical Technology Collective, the Citizen Lab, Point of View Mumbai, UNICEF India and the APC Women's Rights Program. If you'd like to know more about her work and her publications, check out her website on, at bodyofwork.in. Today, she will engage with the currently popular idea that AI ethics can somehow be standardized, managed or governed by sets of principles and ethics boards and committees, which will follow on very nicely from how the previous panel ended and some of the questions that came up in the end. She'll do so by examining a number of different approaches to AI ethics and AI bias, such as policy or computational, industrial, legal, or creative. To my left, we have Slava Jankin. He's a professor of data science and public policy here in Berlin at Hertie School of Governance. He's the director of the Data Science Lab, which advances data science in teaching and research at the institution, and also works with organizations outside of academia to um, advance artificial intelligence or machine learning for the common good. He teaches postgrad courses in applied machine learning and natural language processing, and his um, research on machine learning and public policy is widely published in various academic journals. His previous work at the University of Essex focused on embedding artificial intelligence and data science in public service delivery. He was the university lead on a program called Essex Innovates, which is a partnership between the university and Essex County Council on Police that uses data science and AI to tackle public policy challenges. And you can find out more about his work and his publications on sjankin.com. Today, he will speak about machine learning applications for the public sector for the common good. How can machine learning and AI, for example, be used to benefit public services? What pro products are thinkable and um, what are the design implications of creating them? And um, without further ado, I'd like to pass the word to Maya for her 25-minute presentation. Thank you very much for, for being here and for this, the space to talk to you about, about my work today. Uh, so I'm just gonna put my uh, alarm on. Okay, 
Uh, so I usually do slides that are like black and white. I usually wear black and white, but going with the summer and you know, sort of the, the color with the graphics, I decided that it's the first time ever I'm doing like super uh, bright slides. They look really great on my monitor. I'm sorry if they're really unappealing to you. I like pink. Um, so uh, actually Sophie said a lot of things that I'm going to say, but I like to think that she did the data science version of it and I'm gonna do the, the, the humanities social science version of it. Uh, so just like Sophie started with what we talk about when we talk about AI, it's true. We're often talking about very much the same thing. And I always like to use this slide when I'm starting talks in, in mixed company and mixed groups, um, just to sort of understand where we are at and to feel okay that this is how we understand something. Um, but also I'm, I'm really interested in language and why is it that certain kinds of people deploy particular words to talk about this thing called AI in, in different ways. Um, oh yeah, I wanted to say also before I start that I tend to do a lot of oral citations in my talk, so I tend to cite and quote a lot of other people's work. I'm also going to be presenting some of my work for my dissertation that I've never talked about before. Um, so if you're going to sort of like tweet it or quote it or something, um, please just cite me because when you're working on something for many years and then, um, yeah, it's just valuable to be cited. You'll, you'll understand that, I'm sure. Uh, also, sometimes I talk about theory. I like to tell lots of stories, but I also introduce theory. And I wanna say that, you know, it's good to teach theory like turbulence in an aircraft. Everyone likes to show that they're really badass and they can deal with turbulence when it happens in an aircraft, but you're actually you know, feeling really nervous inside. So if there's theory that comes up and there's not a lot in my talk, just hold on, to, uh, there's no handrail, I mean, uh, there's no armrest here, but just kind of take some deep breaths. The turbulence will pass and we will move on from the theory to other things, I promise. Um, so, okay, so coming back to um, language and why I'm interested in language. So I'm particularly interested in the work of uh, Karen Barad who introduces this word and uh, she talks about this famous surrealist painting which I'm sure you've seen, René Magritte's 19, 1929 painting, The Treachery of Images, Ceci ne pas une pipe. You know this painting, it's the pipe and it says Ceci ne pas une pipe. And, um, the painting asks the question, what is not a pipe? Is it the sentence? Is it the picture of the pipe? Is it the canvas itself? What is not a pipe? And what does it mean for an object to be represented through this image that we call a pipe? And basically, Magritte is trying to shake our faith in this totally arbitrary system of language. Um, and this is what Karen Barad means when she's talking about representationalism, uh, which is a word I like. It's a bit difficult to say sometimes, but if you keep saying it, um, people think you're nuts, but also you get to know what it means uh, and understand it. So it's this idea that we know what something represents without actually making clear where the representation comes from, without sort of unpacking the practices and the performances that go into making something being called something. So whether we're talking about machine learning, robots, AI, we are kind of talking about the same thing, but in different ways to different ends. And also in this talk, we, I mean in this panel, we sort of talk about bias and ethics uh, as if they're all the same thing and one follows from the other and actually to technical people, they're quite different things. Uh, I also like to make the difference between people who work in computation and people who work with technical things. I'm a technical person, I don't work with computation. Um, so so these, all of these words mean something quite specific. So. When we were studying big data five or seven years ago, we were told it's the new oil. Uh, now AI is the new gold, it's the new electricity, and um, these are all kind of like natural resources, which we treat them like natural resources, which should be extracted and capitalized on and colonized. Uh, but they also need to be tamed, because many of you may have seen many of these examples out there if you've been following this field for a while, that there's something very wrong and there's something very broken with the kind of machine learning systems that are applied and integrated into society. So um, you must have heard about Taybot, uh, there's uh, Amazon same day delivery, it was found in a Bloomberg investigation that um, uh, they were not doing same-day deliveries to particular uh, parts of cities in the US. It turns out that all of these cities were, all of these parts of cities were, act, were predominantly black neighborhoods. Now it's not that Amazon was trying to be racist, but there was something about zip codes in the United States which sort of serve as proxies because the society is so segregated in the way that people live historically that 
particular zip codes meant something about people who lived there. And of course, the investigation sort of you know, made Amazon horrified uh, and everyone else. But it's, uh, it's, it was one of those examples that showed us that uh, when so some of these machine learning systems that supposedly automate, make things more efficient, when they integrate with society, there are problems. So Google has a software called Perspective.ai, which is supposed to be a classifier to identify hate speech and toxic speech online. But the problem is Google's um, Perspective.ai was not actually being able to identify toxic speech. So something which white supremacists understand to be a dog whistle, uh, Caroline Sinders talks about this a lot, um, Google didn't pick it up because the Google's uh, hate speech uh, classifier was trained on New York Times comments. It learned language based on comment sections of the New York Times or the Guardian. And how people talk about white supremacy or white nationalism is not the same thing. Or um, uh, it's a quite a, this is quite a well-known example that if you say online and if a hate speech classifier is listening to you or following your words, if you say to break a bitch's neck, you have to press right in the middle and really hard. Now, that's not considered hateful speech. But if you say death to Trump, the hate speech classifier will immediately say, that's hate speech, and we're going to automate, and we'll be sending an automated message to show that this is a violent, hateful speech, because you have put together a call to violent action with the name of a known person. And this comes from hate speech laws in the US, which is where a lot of these systems are regulated. That's their jurisdiction. Um, another example is a project by an MIT scientist called Joy Bulamwini called Gender Shades. And uh, Joy found that a lot of facial recognition databases did not identify um, darker and more female faces. So she went and sat in front of facial recognition technologies, Joy's black, and she noticed that when her white colleagues sat in front of the same facial sensors, the sensors were able to pick them up if they were white. When Joy sat in front of the sensor, it wasn't able to pick her up. When she held a white mask in front of her face, then the system recognized her. So this was the start of a project that's now called Gender Shades, and she actually analyzed these three systems. Uh, Adam also spoke about Face++, uh, and you can see the, the data on it. So the more pale and male you are, the system is better at recognizing you because the data that it's trained on comes from well, it's populated by more pale male faces, but the darker and more female you are, the system just doesn't pick you up. And I'm, I'm gonna come back to this example uh, in a moment. Um, so these are examples of bias. These are all different facets of bias that we're kind of seeing around us. I wanna focus more on um, some of the responses to bias that exist and some of the work I've been doing uh, in, this, in this field. Um, okay, so there's different kinds of responses. There's standards development processes, there's academic scholarship and conferences, there's moves to inclusion and diversity, and I'll start with the most fun one, which is um, ethics boards, principles, uh, institutes. Uh, so about three years ago, I started keeping a spreadsheet of every time somebody said AI plus ethics, I had some Google alerts set up, AI plus ethics, ethics plus autonomy, ethics plus autonomous vehicles, um, AI ethics boards, tech plus ethics. So, f like 2016, 2015, there was like very little traction. And then in the last 18 months, like there's so much to put into the spreadsheet because all of a sudden there's everybody is setting up an AI ethics board or ethics principles. Um, there's a really nice uh, visualization that you can see there, categories of AI principles. So Berkman Klein Center, some scholars there did this. And, um, and this actually, I actually think my spreadsheet has more data on it, um, which I may share with them. Uh, but they're really interesting, like the humanoid agent builders code is one of them, women in ML, Japanese Robotic Society. I mean, you've got the World Economic Forum as well and all of the big players, everybody has their ethics principles. So this visualization really breaks down whether they're grounded in human rights or not, uh, transparency and accountability, what are the main things coming up, and I encourage you to look at it. Also, the last slide I'll have up is all my references, and I'm happy to, to share that and, and put it up. I haven't put my slides up, but that's a good thing to generally do. Um, 
So, uh, but then there's some problems with this that every, and Ben Wagner actually refers to this as ethics washing, when everyone has ethics principles, but then they start behaving in ways that are really unethical or problematic. So the internet noticed that when Stanford recently opened their human-centered artificial intelligence center, um, like known war criminal Henry Kissinger was you know, invited to speak. Or um, Google in April set up its uh, external advisory council for advanced technology, and within a few weeks they had to shut it down because um, there was a known transphobe, anti-immigrant, anti queer person from the Heritage Foundation, K. Cole James, who was on that ethics board. And it's like, uh, within weeks they had to shut it down because again, people were saying this is completely unethical. Um, so there's, the, I mean, you can understand why the companies that are building these things want to seem like they are ethical. Uh, they're actually not. And when we're saying ethics, they're actually saying something else. Um, what's the other response, yes, is uh, academic work. There's been a lot of interest amongst computer scientists and lawyers, primarily in the US and Europe and UK, uh, maybe a few other places as well. Uh, two conferences that I've been involved with. So one is a pretty small one, it's called the Abusive Language Workshop. It's basically computer scientists working on uh, developing hate speech models uh, and they're trying to build classifiers to identify hate speech online that take the burden away from human content moderators, uh, but are also more reflective of the way that people actually speech, uh, speak and not making some of the errors that, you know, like the Google example I was telling you. And so I'm the humanities social science person who's supposed to work with computer scientists and reading some of their papers or making suggestions. And, and it's really challenging and difficult work because we speak such different languages, uh, but it's one of those places that I think is valuable kind of epistemic advocacy, if I can coin a phrase. Um, the other is quite a well-known conference called FAT, F-A-T, FAT Star, Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency. And in, I think in 2013 or 2014, this started as a very small workshop in the United States, and now it's become a full-fledged sort of scientific conference. And what Basically, the computer scientists and lawyers and social scientists and philosophers at this conference are trying to do is to understand how bias comes into algorithmic systems and how we can automate bias out of these systems. Um, I've just been invited to be like uh, reviewing some papers for a new track. For the first time, they have a science and technology studies and a philosophy track because they're aware that you cannot kind of respond to bias through computational means. You need social science perspectives or humanities perspectives as well. And um, I'm kind of curious how that's going to turn out. Uh, we have our first call on Monday, so maybe as a follow-up next time, I'll tell you how it went. Um, and then... Uh, Yes, inclusion and diversity. So going back to this, this one, the Joy's study of gender shades. So Joy's argument is that if more black and brown people were involved in the building and making of these technologies, they would be more representative. They would be more inclusive and you would have more black and brown people represented in these technologies. Um, however, nobody says it better than Professor Alondra Nelson in the tweet there where she says that, especially in a context like the United States, why would you want black and brown people to be visible to systems that are actually being used to surveil them and uh, be violent towards them? So this is a really problematic weaponization of the notion of diversity. So even as we say we want things to be more inclusive and diverse, we sort of have to recognize, as Sophie was saying, and as somebody who works in a lot of these companies, that. Uh, uh, this is not really diversity. This is, you don't really want to be included in these, in these systems necessarily. So um, we have to sort of like constantly question what it means to be involved in the production of these technologies. And, um, you know, maybe it's more powerful to just, I don't know, seize the memes of production rather than the means of production. Um, and then the last example I want to talk about is of people trying to respond to bias is something else I've been involved with for the last um, little over a year. So this is a standards development process by an organization called the IEEE, the Institute for Electronics and Electrical Engineers. And IEEE is one of these big standards bodies. There are about four of them. They're, they determine how a lot of our technical infrastructure from electromagnetic spectrum to the internet to 
a lot of technical systems around us, how they're architected and how they're supposed to work. So there's IEEE, there's IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force, there's the Internet uh, ITU and ICANN. ICANN determines all of your, your domains and you know, uh, what your URLs look like. So the IEEE is supposed to be this non-partisan body that develops standards for technical infrastructure. And about two years ago, may, maybe a little more than two years ago, they started developing standards for autonomous and intelligent systems because these were new systems and nobody knew how they worked. So they had this series called P7003. And uh, I knew some computer scientists who said, P7003 is about building a taxonomy for algorithmic bias considerations. If people are building software, they need to know what algorithmic bias is. How do you code it? What does it look like? Uh, what are the contexts in which it's, it's used and, and implemented? And how do you manage it? So, and they, I think there was a very real effort to be uh, inclusive and diverse in getting more and more people outside of industry and outside of business and outside of the United States to be part of this process. At that time, I thought it would be kind of sexy to do a whole ethnographic study being embedded in, um, being embedded in actually something boring like standards development, but for people who do infrastructure studies, you know that you know, something like being part of standards development is like actually boring, but so much fun. Um, so I got involved in P7003, and what that meant was being on a call every month for an hour or two with complete strangers, and then writing this document with them, again with people you've never met and will never meet again. And actually, it's a lot of hard work, and it's true, it's really boring, uh, because you have to break everything down. But I kind of like plugged on with it, and I was very kind of excited about it. Um, but I eventually had to drop out because it was mostly, un it is all completely unpaid work. Uh, I'm still sort of tangentially involved in the process. Um, I mean, I get all the emails and I just filter them and I don't read them. Uh, but this is actually, they've now actually got a master working document, which is amazing because when I, I was doing, I think I was overseeing the documenting and transparency and the cultural issues, obviously. Um, they'd want, you know, brown lady in tech to manage the cultural issues part of it. But anyway, um, so it was, it was all great fun up until the point where it just got to be too much work. The document is looking really good now. But it's, but yeah, there's a lot of having to say, this is how bias happens in all of those examples and so many more. Breaking down from a computational perspective how bias happens um, and then how to correct for it. And I think the point that I'm trying to make in all of this is that we're trying to sort of come up with very precise flowcharts, diagrams. I study a lot of patents as well. Uh, of how, an, how a lot of these systems can identify the source of bias and then correct for them. So we basically want to um, automate and computationally manage bias. And so I want to switch for a moment to talk about another technology to put this desire in, in, in perspective and go back to a much older technology called the uh, ECG, the electrocardiogram. It's the one, you know it, it's got these long spindly arms and then it's attached to electrodes and it measures your electrical, the electrical activity of your heart and it come, makes those squiggles and the doctor reads it and tell you, tells you if you're gonna have a heart attack or not. So the thing is doctors use a lot of different kind of data and heuristics to identify who's gonna have an, a heart attack and when they're gonna have the heart attack. So they decided to automate it because there was just too many criteria and this is what happens, right? You automate it. But they started automating the diagnostic process like in the 1960s. And the first studies were done in the US, obviously, uh, and they did it, the first studies were done with about 500 US uh, army veterans, all men. And this is how they developed standards for how the machine should be calibrated, how it should know um, how it should spit out a result and say that this person is nearing a heart attack or is showing anom anomalies in heart rate and heart activity. Um, and then about 20 years later, they realized that women were having heart attacks, but the ECG machines were not picking them up because they had never collected data about how women have heart attacks. And women's health-seeking behavior, first of all, is entirely different from men's health-seeking behavior, I think, everywhere in the world. And it uh, turns out that not all hearts are the same. And women, and there was not enough data about how it is that women experience heart attacks and when they do. And in the 1980s, they realized that there were a lot of people who were at risk and they were not being identified. And the machine, you, so you couldn't just suddenly now say, 
oh, let's just recalibrate the machine, because he had absolutely no basis for data about how women have heart attacks. And it took, and so they had to sort of like almost start from scratch. And it took them about 20 years to actually collect enough data about how it is that women have heart attacks. And it's only as recently as 2007 and 2012 that they started recalibrating electrocardiogram machines to actually be able to pick up the fact that women, that 10 years before you have a heart attack is when your ECG tells, um, tells a doctor that you're going to have it. So the point is that it's all, very, all well and good that we want to develop all of these different systems to be able to address the bias. But the problem with the idea of bias itself, when we use this word you know, in everyday speech. It's like, a, it's like a personal perception. It's like stereotyping. It's something that you and I are supposed to manage and control. And Kinjal Dave writes about this really well when she says that when we're looking at bias, we're making it a matter of individual perception and we're not being able to talk about the structural racism, the structural violence, the structural sexism that, I mean, it still kind of like moves me and makes my hair stand on end that you couldn't, we don't have data about how women have heart attacks. So like all of these people died because the machine was just not calibrated to pick that up. So actually I think a lot of things we've built in the last 40 years are kind of broken and they don't work. Anyway, so just to sort of like wind up in my three minutes and 47 seconds. Um, I'm, so this is the, the I'm coming back to Ceci Nepa, uh ethics. And this is the idea that I'm trying to propose with my work, this phrase called computational ethics, that uh, I study how, I study sort of patents, I study proposals by computer scientists and political philosophers and economists um, to determine ethics either top down from a machine, that if you behave in these ways, you will compute an outcome which is considered ethical. I look at how these are now bottom up thanks to machine learning, the programmer doesn't need to program from the top down. You can just collect all of our opinions about something on the internet and say, oh, um, this is what people on the internet think is a value, or this is morality, and then we can use it to feed machine learning systems, so there's that. Uh, there are examples where you have machines working on particular tasks, like sentences or phrases, um, like, um, what's the white supremacist phrase? We must protect this nation for our children. This is a very banal phrase, but it's a dog whistle amongst white supremacists. So if a machine says this is not toxic, but a human who knows and a human who understands nuance can correct the machine and say, no, this is, this is uh, actually hate speech. So you have some of those examples. But I think that um, uh, what, what, we're trying to, what I'm trying to sort of say is that you can have the idea that ethics can be computed by a machine, but as important, if not more so, is this larger socio-technical apparatus, what I call the ethical apparatus, that makes it possible for us to think that ethics is um, a particular thing that I can name, that I can measure, that I can build a machine that will compute that and will be able to measure it. This is the standard for it. Um, and that the ethical apparatus allows us to, to believe that if we just had a way of seeing this thing, we can then computationally tweak it and, and erase it. Uh, so ethics in the end is not really about ethics, but I'm arguing that ethics actually becomes an interface because if you think about what, ethics, uh, what interfaces actually do, they sort of sit between the abstractions and the complexities of the machine system, which we can't see and we don't understand, and we make it easy to use, easy to pr process. Um, but it's also the sort of barrier between the world and the machine system. It sort of processes the world outside and the complexity and the messiness of the world outside and makes it accessible to the machine system. So um, ethics is actually the sort of interface which obfuscates what's going inside the machine um, and sort of manages these abstractions. And unfortunately, I think the abstractions are us. The abstractions are society. The abstraction is what is broken in our sociality, in our and in our relationships. So on that um, very positive note, I want to end and say thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions later. Thank you, Mai. Uh, we'll now move on to Slava's presentation, and then we'll move on to discussion and questions in the end.
Um, all right, thank you. Um, I will talk, uh, th there's quite a lot of overlap with what's been discussed before. My focus is AI for common good, and this is an experience that I, the work and the experience uh, that we've done in UK. Uh, I just moved to Berlin two months ago, so it's really fresh and recent. So let me um, just briefly, these are all the, these are all the points that we discussed about this is the, quite a lot of scare of AI, quite a lot of promise of AI, and it's moving from the mess up of the rollout of the, um, the welfare system, the algorithmic basis for the welfare reform in UK recently, similar problems we witnessed in US where we try to automate some of the public services and we mess it up, not thinking about the people. So in UK, the rollout of the welfare reform um, depended on online access. It was digital by design and it was depending on online access for people who seek welfare. And obviously quite a few people on welfare do not have access to internet, do not have access to online to check emails and able to come to the appointments that are given and then if they miss the appointment, they're penalized, their welfare is reduced. It's quite a few things that were not thought through in the rollout of the system. Again, it's not just UK, similar things happen in Michigan and in India in the welfare system. We also know about the algorithmic bias that is in um, judicial system in US, the point of the compass system in recidivism predi prediction. We know these th things are happening. We also have bits and pieces of the promise of artificial intelligence starting from the medical side where we can uh, now much better. We can, there's an example from Nature, Nature News, uh, a recent research that is showing that looking at the patterns of brain activity, trying to generate text for people who cannot speak and that's the first time we get into the point that they will be able to communicate. It's still a bit, it's imperfect, but the research is there and it's bringing together machine learning and natural language processing and trying to devise this. There's also this recent study that was developed in trying to predict in, in art and humanities, trying to predict the identity of a painter, of an artist because sometimes we don't know. Some of those pieces we have disputed identities of artists and using machine learning to do that. So it's from medical devices to criminal system, criminal judge, um, judicial system to arts and humanities. It's a full spectrum starting from the promise to actually full blown scare and what we face. And um, just to move to the scary bit, this is the deep fakes, right? The, the deep fakes is, um, is the scale of the week, the political scale of the week. We're just expecting what will happen in 2020 when US elections are rolling it down and the level of deep fakes moving to this really sophisticated where, where the video message is faked, where the audio message is faked. We have early examples that are really cheap and simple, so the cheap fakes, but we, we see the sophistication and it's developing really quickly. So um, there's an example of Trump. It's difficult to judge where's the real Trump or where's the um, Saturday Night Live impersonation of Trump. And this is just going to increase dramatically. But we also, this is not new. We've seen it before. Um, and another, another approach that, that recently made the headlines is in United Nations speeches. And this is something that... Um, that is really reminiscent of George Orwell's 1984. Uh, the first, I don't know how many people heard about GPT-2, the algorithm that was put out by um, OpenAI. Algorithm itself and the code was not released, but there are quite a few really smart people around the world who were able to uh, backward engineer the underlying algorithm. And the idea is that you can generate text Last week, it was applied to uh, generate, artificially generate, so generate text in United Nations statements. It's really similar to the research that I've been doing on United Nations. It's the leaders of the world who appear in New York every September to give this opening statement in United Nations. So now we have an algorithm that is using existing technology 
and applying this deep fake approach to generate fake statements of leaders. This is really simple, really straightforward. People behind it were actually UN Global Pulse, and they were trying to show the potential damage that can be done with really existing algorithms, and they spent only about $8 and 13 hours to generate these fake speeches. And you can scale it up and think about what can happen, right? But uh, we've seen cheap fakes before, and the cheap fakes, we are a bit accustomed to cheap fakes. Uh, we know what Photoshop can do. And we've seen Putin riding a bear in all kinds of ways. And we do have a bit of a skepticism when we see another picture of Putin on a bear, or any other animal for that matter. We, we understand what is happening, that probably somebody had too much fun or too much time to have fun with uh, Photoshop. And again, it's a... Um, Photoshop is excellent technology, but before that, uh, people were doing these cheap fakes. Um, there's an example um, of during the Stalin in the purges, when a political leader would get purged in the great purges in the Soviet Union, the person would be registered out, photoshopped out without the Photoshop, right? So we've seen it before, and we are more accustomed, so maybe over time we'll get more accustomed to deep fakes as well, and we'll have some kind of a trust label on them saying that this is real Trump and this is a fake Trump uh, that is actually accepting his um, role in the, in the election interference. But uh, with an overlap with quite a few other presentations, let me just, um, what is AI? And AI, you can read the definition on the screen, but they range from the early definition by Alan Turing, one of the really um, simple but unimaginably difficult definitions to ever achieve. And another one that is European Commission put forward in its position paper in Communique that is really much more straightforward and uh, we can understand, we can try to piece out. I'm not going to do um, the, the breaking down of this, but uh, let me just say that there's a spectrum of definitions that was also covered in the previous panel. And we, uh, we come a long way. So we started, this is roughly the third coming of AI, starting from the 50s, as Tatiana will say, we are now in the stage, probably another spring of AI, everybody is waiting for another winter of AI, but we've seen winters before. We've seen lots of investment going to AI, lots of investment um, evaporating, and quite a few researchers expect another winter. So where we are, we don't know. Uh, but one thing we do know is that it's a progress and the progress is dramatic. But one thing I want to say is that AI by itself, AI today, it's not magic. It's really straightforward. A lot of things that we discussed, a lot of things we discussed today, and also some things we, most of the things we discussed in previous panel, when we talk about AI, we quite often in general discussion, what we mean is ML, machine learning, and the underlying algorithms of machine learning. This is the, really the big thing that we discussed. So there's the blur, as we mentioned. If we expand the blur a bit to societal impact and maybe a bit of a scientific approach to try to generate insights, we get data science into the loop. It doesn't matter how we define it. Um, in the end, the bottom line is that it's not magic. In this diagram, you have all kinds of things. You have receptors, you have the models, but the AI bit is really just a tiny component of the larger underlying systems. And these systems, they can contain lots of things that we quite easily understand and we can study. And these are the subfields of AI. And it's easier to think about AI as containing these subfields. It's anything from the core machine learning that includes deep learning to natural language processing where we try, so your Siri and your spam filters, that's your natural language processing to robotics, to vision, to optimization. These are all the subfields of AI. So <clears throat> if we think that AI is not magic, but simply a set of tools, that might be an easy way to conceptualize it as containing these tools, these subfields and the tools, and it might be easier to think about it. So this is just an intro and a, an overlap with what we've been discussing before. But let me just tell you about uh, uh, my experience and what we've been doing in terms of the policy on the policy side and implementation of AI and data science for the common good. So this is an example of um, what we worked on uh, in UK just before I left. It's the creation um, of this Essex Center for Data Analytics. 
And the Essex Center for Data Analytics was bringing together the University, University of Essex, Essex Police, and Essex County Council. And the idea was, the vision is to create this exemplar uh, of a system that's bringing together data, but also specifically to answer the really difficult questions that public sector faces in delivery of services. And this is all for common good, right? So that was the, the vision and the aims, and we worked on this and setting it up. So just to illustrate what it is, and just to show you the common good aspect of that, this is one of the projects. A project is um, it's a risk profile for school readiness. School readiness is a concept that was um, that encapsulates in the UK. I'm not sure what is the same in Germany, but when a kid goes to school, the kid has to have a certain um, certain set of criteria have to be fulfilled. So the kid has to be comfortable being separated from parents for the duration of the school day. The kid has to be comfortable sitting um, still for about 20 minutes. He has to be comfortable to um, audibly say that, for example, there's a toilet, he wants a toilet or she wants a toilet break. So it's a certain set of skills that are expected from a child when the child arrives in, in the first grade, the reception. So if this does not happen, then um, the school has to identify that, but also it has to essentially bring in a separate teacher who will be working with a small group. So it becomes quite costly for public services, for school services specifically. So this uh, separating the kids uh, and trying to bring them up to the level of the rest of the class. So there's a clear impact because if the money needs to be spent on this additional teacher who is working with a subset of kids in class, that is taking the money from the water educational budget, so the money that can be spent on something else. So the task for the project was whether we can predict the hotspots of the school readiness. So the areas in a specific pilot um, in a county, a pilot area, where we can identify within this area the hotspots, the sub areas where kids may be not school ready. And the pilot was developed so it can never be done on an individual basis because it has to be privacy preserving within the general framework of GDPR. So it's about the hotspots, several households that are not individually identifiable. But we can identify the hotspots, we can identify based on the factors that social workers know. So it's the cultural knowledge that the social care workers can bring to the table, working together with analysts and developing models to predict that. So applying machine learning models to predict and try to identify these hotspots and then developing the key here is developing interventions and developing interventions in order to try to tackle this issue of school readiness before kids actually go to school. So aiming for the age of two, so finding two year olds, developing an intervention and then making sure that they're ready. So the algorithms works Okay, 74% accuracy rate, we may not be happy with it, but uh, one thing that I learned in public sector is that quite often good enough is good enough. We're not developing academic papers, we're working for common good and uh, there's a high pressure to develop something that brings benefit quickly. So here's um, what was done. It was an intervention and the intervention was to develop a preschool center where parents can bring their kids. And it's not exclusive only to the kids that from the neighborhoods that were identified. It is based in the neighborhood where we identified that there's a hotspot of uh, school readiness. Um, but we, it's open to any kids uh, who can come in and they play there, there's educational program. And the idea is that slowly they will be over the course of two years by bringing them in. It's working with the parents and the kids will be brought up to the level of um, school readiness before they go to school. So it's really improving the lives of people on the ground with some of the machine learning tools applied and the key here is linking the data between the county council, police and the university bringing the expertise in developing the models. So this is just an example of a quite a simple intervention. We don't know how it works, the intervention is in the field. We need to wait another year before the kids end up in school, but that's, that's an intervention based on real research and um, real research for common good. It can be done also from the point of view of developing better 
public sector pra practices. So this is an example from the cabinet office where they use natural language processing to try to identify the case files of social care workers. You look at the case files and you try to predict whether some of the cases, so kids in case files, whether some of the cases are referred from the system, but some period down the line the kids may be re-entering the system. And if they re-enter the system, it's the wasted time where some intervention could have happened. And whether based on the report we can predict this and develop an intervention and apply it and solve the problem before it happens. So it's already, it's another, another intervention for common good that can be improving the efficiency of public se sector services. Um, there are also some services where we need to communicate better and the public sector service needs to communicate better. So these are the examples of several councils in UK where we had, so the Hackney and the Thorough councils, they looked at vulnerable people de developing the support. Uh, Brent Council was looking at children at risk of uh, criminal um, exploitation. The way that the models were set up and the way it was developed, it had common good as the underlying goal, but the communication was not done um, extremely well. So it was picked up in the media. So these are the headlines from The Guardian that picked up on these projects. And uh, the headlines themselves, they are not, uh, you probably cannot read, so I'll read them. So the Guardian headlines are data on thousands of children used to predict risk of gang exploitation. Another headline, councils used 377,000 people's data in efforts to predict child abuse. The headlines themselves are fine. It's the text within the Guardian articles that raises the question whether council should be doing anything like that. Whether any of this predictive policy making should be in place and whether data can be used to deliver public good. So what we developed within EGDA, and this is to Maya's point, is going to be another bingo game, the ethics standard. So we have ethics uh, and the ethics board that is a separate ethics board that was set up. It brings all the stakeholders, for example, in the school readiness project that would be stakeholders from the parents, local community groups, it would be also social care workers, and they will be together discussing whether any project can be actually initiated even before it starts going. So there's, there's quite a lot of this in the NESTA report on state of offices of data analytics in UK. There are nine of them at the moment going on, and all of them are different stages of development. The underlying drive behind all of them is that local government in UK is facing shortages because of austerity. There's less and less money to deliver services and AI data science is viewed as a way to try to tackle it. It's not ideal, but it's the way to do it. So just to wrap it up, it may seem that these projects are easy, but it's not always that easy. It's not always easy to work with different organizations and it's not always, these projects are not easy to be lifted off the ground. So although we may be afraid that AI is taking over the world and even this narrow, shallow AI that I mentioned, the data science project that are quite simple and straightforward, it is quite often, it's extremely difficult to get any of these projects started. And that may be viewed as a safety valve in the whole system. So we worked under the general policy principle of, uh, this is from the UK industrial strategy, AI sector deal, that there should be collaboration between public sector, private sector, and academia working on projects related to AI and data science. So there's this huge umbrella policy that is allowing us, giving us legitimacy to work on these projects. So we developed a project um, that was the Catalyst project that was specifically designed to collaborate between the university and the councils in delivering AI for common good. And it was viewed by the policymakers really favorably. The leader of the council viewed it as a great step forward and an example of uh, really productive work that can be done. But actually, what happened when we looked into the individual projects, we conducted interviews with uh, people working in the councils, universities, university researchers working on the projects, and one thing that we identified is that it's extremely difficult to get any project started. From the inception of the project to actually the kickoff of the project can be from six months to one year. Data sharing becomes 
a huge problem. If you want to share data and you want to work on data, ML researchers would love to work on data. That's what they love. They want to get data um, on their machines. They want to run their models, identify problems, and that's great. The only problem is that data never leaves premises. It is quite naive to think that it's easy to move data from a public sector organization to any outside organization, be it university or Google or Facebook, and allow them to work on the data. That almost never happens. And when it happens, there's a huge scandal that follows. And data privacy officers and organizations learn from the scandals, so it makes it even more improbable for the data to ever leave. So we may think that AI and all this data privacy issues that we discussed, in reality, in my experience, it's extremely difficult to see it in practice. Uh, when we're talking about collaboration between private sector and public sector, at least in Europe, within the GDPR umbrella that is providing this nice policy overview. Um, we moving beyond the data sharing, it's anything else. It's from the misalignment of priorities. Private sector care, uh, cares about the bottom line. University researchers care about research papers. Public sector doesn't care about any of that. They care about delivering service and delivering service because this is their, they're legally required to deliver service. So misalignment of priorities, misalignment of the timelines, it also it makes it extremely difficult for any of the projects to work. So although we can have some projects that show common good, it would be naive to think that it's extremely easy to set them up and it would be extremely easy to think that uh, it's, the data will be easily passing between the public sector and private or university for that matter. So just to finish off, um, these are the 10 points that Nesta identified. These are the questions that any project that is working with public sector or any kind of algorithmic decision making, 10 questions that should be answered or should be at least considered before the project moves ahead. And this is starting from objective, use, impact, assumption, the data, inputs, mitigation, ethics, oversight, and evaluation. And all of this, they provide a framework and lots of the discussions before, there's a safety net if organizations start answering the questions. And there's much more in the Nesta report behind this, and the link is on the on the slide. So this is just to finish off to say that personally I'm a bit more optimistic about um, AI impact on our lives and it's partly due to the fact that it's extremely difficult to get any of these projects off the ground and when we do get them off the ground there's a clear benefit that can be delivered. So I'll finish with that. Well, thank you. Is that working? Yeah, okay. Well, thank you both for your excellent presentations. We'll move into a discussion now. I'll start with a couple of questions I've come up with, and then we'll open it up for the um, audience to participate in the discussion. I, I'll keep my question quite general in a way that you'll hopefully be able to speak to across both of your presentations and leave the details to the audience and so you get to ask um, the, the nitty-gritty of what you're interested in. So first off, I'd like to pick up on something that Slava just um, talked about in his work around data science or machine learning for the common good. And it also speaks a little bit to uh, what Maya was um, talking about earlier in terms of this trend of um, coming up with um, ethics principles and or, yeah, these kinds of sets of principles that guide or don't guide um, ethical behavior. Um, I wonder when we say things like um, AI for common good or machine learning for common good, what is the common good or who gets to define what's good for the commons in a sense. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, right, so I, I'm not going to speak for all the common good that is out there, uh, but um, in the specific case of school readiness, the parents, um, parents wanted something done. Mm -hmm. 
and then also it was really beneficial for the county council because they could save the money. So there's, the, there's a specific interest in that, that uh, you have people, you want to call them users of public services or consumers of public services who benefit from that. So that's, the, that's one approach to that. And this is really narrow, and I guess there would be a much more elaborate approach um, that Maya can tap into, but that's, that's my view that it comes from the people and they quite often decide what, is, what they want and whether they can benefit from that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Maya, would, would you like to add something? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, it's so much to say, but I'll say that um, I agree with, a, I mean, I've learned a lot from computer scientists and mathematicians who want to really, really narrow down very specifically the problem. And maybe if you're in a very specific space, like, you know, uh, then you can maybe talk about what the problem is if you're talking about school readiness or exploitation or criminality or whatever. Uh, you have to go really deep. I don't know if it's possible to have these broad abstract notions. I think the commons is broken. Maybe the commons was never great in the first place to start off with, you know. So I'm a little bit more cynical on the idea of uh, the common and the good. Um, so maybe I'm not a good person then to talk about the common good because I don't think it exists. Or maybe I'll say that, you know, we have the, the bet. The, I read this great quote from Lauren Berlant, which I love, which is politics is also the better distribution of insecurity. And I think maybe that's a better starting point to start thinking about when we say the common or the commons. Um, yeah, maybe I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, and then sort of following from that, um, I guess the wider conversation about AI bias has at least tentatively sort of embraced taking about, talking about sexist bias and racist bias and um, respectively sexist or racist outcomes of algorithmic bias. Uh, and that of course remains an extremely necessary ongoing conversation. But I do also wonder and wanted to ask both of you, um, what are we missing in, in those conversations? What, what other types of bias are out there that we should maybe be paying attention to? Um, yes, essentially, what, what is the conversation around AI ethics, if I may use that buzzword as well, or AI bias missing? And um, I'll, I'll have another question about bias coming up in a minute, but I thought I'd put that out there first. What are we missing at this point? Um, so, first of all, I think that quite often we, we talk about um, bias in algorithms and we assume that this is only, it's only in algorithms that we see this bias, but humans are biased and Algorithms are quite honest in reflecting underlying bias that is in the data. And this data is quite often generated by humans. There can be all kinds of problems in data generation. We talked about in the first session about it, about the da uh, data sets and what is available and the difference in data sets. But on top of it, uh, we are biased and we may not admit it, but we are biased. And sometimes we develop models that are quite true and honest. They reflect our biases. And this is in the language. So I work in natural language processing. And that's one of the things you often uh, pick up is that we, our models will be reflecting the biases that are represented in the speeches, in the text that we analyze. But those texts and speeches are generated by real humans. So there's, a, there's, there's another layer to the whole AI bias debate. Obviously it is there and we have Lots of examples, we have lots of work trying to debias it successfully, unsuccessfully, but there's also lots of things we need to think about ourselves as well, about the bias that we bring to the whole thing. Thank you very much. Would you um, like to add something? Yeah, I think that there's something very seductive about calling something bias, and as I was saying, the idea that if I just localize it, if I just make it the outcome of an algorithmic process, then I should be able to tweak it. I should do some weighting, as in w -E, weights, W-E-I-G-H-T-S, um, to, to reverse or balance that process. And um, I think, I mean, scientists will say that, yes, the bias comes from many sources. Uh, there are many technical, there's a lot of kind of great technical 
whiz-bangery jargon about historical bias and bias in the data from different sources. I think all of those things are super valid, um, but I want to actually tell a little anecdote about uh, a from a conference that I went to a couple of years ago. It was an AI and ethics conference that was being organized by uh, one of these premier, well, one of the oldest um, AI organizations from 1979. It's called Triple AI, Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. It's one of those like shady California, you know, sort of like they're gonna, they're gonna, yeah, they're kind of like the Illuminati or something. I hope this is not going out on the internet. But anyway, um, so it was the Triple AI had set up this this AI and ethics conference, and there was all of these scientific papers about bias and everything. And uh, I asked a question. There was actually a fantastic paper that I really loved, where this woman was talking about how they tried to make a digital assistant in a university setting for um, to respond to students better, because they noticed that the way the the digital assistant was programmed did not acknowledge that you might have a student who's dropped out of classes because they're pregnant, for example. They're not turning in their forms or their uh, assignments or they're going to take time off. Uh, so just to kind of cater to pregnant people in the class, they kind of they, they acknowledge the bias and they retweaked it. And I thought it was like, this is what I meant about being specific. In certain contexts, you're working with spe specific situations and populations and you need to go deep into that. So after that, I wanted to stay and talk to some of the people and say that, um, can we, is it possible to even imagine on scale like more creative, radical approaches to how some of these systems are built? And uh, nobody on the panel really wanted to uh, respond to my question, but I was trying to sort of push at it. And then later, a woman came to me, and she works at NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And um, she basically said that it's really nice that you want to think that you could try and radically change the system, like what do you mean? And I said, what about different training data sets, for example? This is something that a lot of people talk about now. If we use better training data sets, then the machines won't be trained on, you know, all of the terrible things that we say and do, uh, or they won't be so skewed and biased. And she, and she kind of thought about it for a while, and she said, that's a really nice idea, but it's going to take so long to do that. It's going to take a very long time. It's like the ECG story. It took them 20 years to develop data about how women have heart attacks so they could recalibrate the machines. And she said, you know, I mean, like business is not going to wait. And this is what happens to some of these conversations where you come to this point very quickly where you're actually trying to pull the plug on the entire system and, you know, say the C word and, you know, as in capitalism and be like, oh, the problem is capitalism. And that kind of takes you nowhere or kind of leaves you at this, or people imagine and think. Uh, and I think that's one, that's kind of my response to dealing with bias. I don't know if that's the best way to do it, but I know that it's not about saying, can we just tweak it? But maybe in some situations, you can't have these off the shelf solutions to, you know, this, this machine kills bias, this machine kills ethics, you know, in this sort of blanket way. Yeah, sense. absolutely, and, and yeah, I'll, I'll just pick up on that straight away because that's kind of where my last question was going in the sense that we tend to talk or hear or read about bias as if it was this evil thing that we need to get rid of at all cost. And if you then sort of juxtapose that with feminist thinking about bias or about objectivity or... Um, the general idea that all knowledge is situated and contextual and that bias isn't something that you can get rid of. I, I wonder, and I'm going to ask you instead of wondering, <laughs> um, how could we uh, sort of translate those types of ideas to bias in machine learning, which, as um, Slava explained earlier, is, is of course created by human bias and by social and structural bias. I don't know, yeah, how can we bring these sort of feminist or intersectional ideas around situated knowledges, around um, problematizing objectivity into an entirely different sector that strongly relies on thinking um, scientifically and objectively in some ways? Can if you know. I kind of disrupt the process, your, your question a little bit and add my question to it to sort of uh, because this is what I wrote down and I wanted to, to ask you about. If A, what were the sort of points at which you found the system breaking down, the one on school readiness? Like, where did you see it breaking down? Um, and how did you preempt that? Or how did you imagine what the system would look like when it went into society? 
and how to kind of deal with the fact that knowledge is situated, that we're bringing these systems into contexts that are well established and exist. Like, if you had to make that system respond better to people and communities that it's supposed to be about and for, I mean, like, I think that's one approach to say, you can't just automate this shit out, you know, you build it in a different way. So I'm kind of curious about did the people have, if you could talk a little bit more about the role of people in those systems, because actually Slava's been working on a system. I just kind of think this stuff up. Um, so do I, <laughs> please, Slava. Um, right, so in this, in this specific example, um, the system is built bringing parents are involved, right? Mm -hmm. So parents are involved, social care workers are involved. Essentially, anyone who is, in, who is a recipient of this is involved. I guess two-year-old kids are not directly involved, only as uh, recipients of interventions. But other than that, everybody was involved in discussions. It was a really slow process. It started off with a community discussion to actually bring everybody on board, even before any kind of discussion of data started. It was a community um, town hall meeting, so community engagement, getting everybody on board and saying if the people will buy into that. There's no point of developing intervention if nobody's gonna buy into the intervention. It was always involving everybody who will be potentially interested in that. The point where the system breaks down, and that's another point why I don't think that it's that easy for AI to take over the world, is that, um, for this system to work, there has to be data linkage between county council data on social care, police data on, for example, emergency referrals, um, and also hospital data on um, emergency uh, presentations. But uh, you cannot just link up ginormous data sets. Nobody allows you. Legally, you're not allowed to do that. So the data protection officers they, you require to specify exactly the variables that you want, and that's where the discussion with the communities, discussion with the social care workers, discussion with people who actually did this for 30 years, uh, what are the variables they think are relevant here, and you link them up into a really tiny data set by all imaginable standards. It's a quite tiny data set in the end. You link it together, and only this one is allowed to be analyzed you never have access to the full data. So in terms of what breaks down is we don't know about the biases um, that we don't pick up because a lot of the potentially variables that will be related are not included for all kinds of reasons. We don't have access to that. So in the end, um, the prediction rate can be at 74%. And we can say that maybe we would have got 95% if we linked up all the remaining data but this is impossible, legally impossible to do. So we have to settle for 74% and we have to bring social care workers to look at the predicted hotspots and then qualitatively make a judgment call whether it's fine or it's just bullshit, right? Uh, so in the end, social care workers were really happy with the result and that was the final evaluation that we were happy with. So that was actually going to be my question. Like, did anyone talk about why you needed the system in the first place? Like, what was so broken in this community that you needed a system which was actually not robust? And this is the thing. I mean, Reid Halpern's kind of history of a lot of these systems talks about how in the last 40 years, all of these systems have been built that are essentially quite broken. And what was broken in society that the machine thought that the system needed to fix? And um, Virginia Eubanks talks beautifully about you know um, systems, public welfare systems in the U.S. and ha and automating some of these responses to it. So like, how do social care workers? I mean, I'm I'm sort of surprised that they would they liked the response when actually this is about their jobs or maybe social care workers having to manage these systems that were only 74%, because this is the thing with autonomous and intelligent systems, the role of the human is changing to actually manage systems that are kind of wobbly. So how did their, how did their work change? How did their perception of their systems and their jobs change? I mean, I think that's also part of the story. So the, the one thing that was broken is lack of money in educational budgets, right? We can say whatever we want, but if schools don't have money, something needs to happen. And you cannot just magically make up money if you have austerity going on. 
And I know it might be difficult to understand the Germany, but there's a, there's a country across the channel that is uh, trying to uh, shoot itself in the foot repeatedly uh, with Brexit. Um, so the system is broken in that sense already. Social care workers obviously are human beings who observe that and know that it's broken. So the system was never designed to replace them. It was always there to help them. Um, they were always in charge, and that was just an additional piece of information that was given to them to make their lives easier and make their jobs um, easier, and for them to carry out their tasks under this overhang of less money available. So in a way that was driven by the, by the wider social care system itself and educational budget itself. Okay, thank you both. Let's open this up for questions from the audience. Are there any questions? There is one here and one in the very back. Hi. Oh, it's, yeah, it's on. Okay. Um, so recently I saw a study and it was about, like, it was about AI for good. And, oh, so loud. And uh, basically it was trying to say that uh, there were, they were studying people to try to help um, addicts who are gamblers online. And so that was like the AI for good to help the gamblers so that they can have, you know, I don't know, improved services or something. But there was like one line in this thing where, which, said, which basically made it clear that actually the people with the money, like the gambling companies or people behind the power, they just wanted to protect their money and like they didn't want the people who couldn't afford to pay their debts to be involved. They basically wanted to kind of like ostracize them because, you know, and so it's like it's covered under the umbrella of like AI for good. And then in, at, in that moment in my mind, I'm like AI, AI, for, AI for good is, is, is kind of bullshit. And like anytime you look at it, there's all, you always have to like follow the money trail and like where and why and who. And in my mind, I mean, the thing is I agree, like, well, when you told your story, I was just thinking, like, it's really a shame that that money would go to a study on AI rather than to educate the people in the first place in the community who probably needed it. But, um, but I guess also, just in general, like, we, like, everybody's broke, you know? It's like artists are broke, academics are broke. And so I can totally imagine that these social, um, like, sociologists or whoever it was, they saw an opportunity to have funding and then they were like okay let's do this and like we'll be willing to do this or something so like I don't know I guess I just want to like originally it was a question but actually you've talked about this quite a lot already so like questioning AI for good but I guess I also wanted to just reiterate that message of like for all of us in the audience for example whenever we're reading these things it might like because there were hundreds of likes on this one guy's post that was like, AR for good, look, we're fixing gambling, blah, blah, blah. And then I made my comment, and of course I got shit for it because they're like, yeah, right, you know, like, you didn't read the article, blah, blah, blah. And just, and like, people are just such in denial for funding. And it's just like, can we just like start being real and like fund things that like matter and will make real change instead of just p pushing the dollars around and pretending like we care or something? I mean, I care. I know some people care, but it's like, I don't know, you know, it's just like, come on, people, that's it. We had another question at the back. Yeah, please raise your hand so the microphones can find you. And I should be using mine, I suppose. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Riley Hühner. I'm a professor of computer science uh, from North Rhine-Westphalia. Thank you very much, Maya, for your talk. Um, you gave a huge overview about what is known about uh, discrimination in artificial intelligence, and you made links to the huge amount of research which has been done in the many, many years before in feminist social technology, uh, science and technology studies, for example. And also there are some approaches within computer science, for example, participatory design, and looking at what are we doing with these computer systems. And um, so I, I want to share with you that there are two feelings inside of me. First thing is that I'm shocked. So we see computer scientists and they present projects funded by public money from everybody here. And all we hear is that people were involved. 
in a public town hall meeting. So there was some information, there was no much more information about how this involvement was, but when we talk about participation, there are so many levels of participation, and what we need is that the people who are, in, uh, uh, who are concerned with this, that they have the possibility to decide not that they are informed, but that they can decide what is done there. And I did not hear something about that. And so I want to share with you that I'm shocked what computer scientists, and I'm a computer scientist, what they are doing. And the other thing is that I want to share with you is I don't understand why do we give computer scientists so much power? They don't deserve it. They are doing things and they don't know what they are doing because this artificial intelligence thing is, we have this data, we are doing things and we are feeding back the data back. So we have bias in the data at the start, we are having this uh, feedback uh, uh, mechanism and we all know since faster 50 years ago what's going on in these complex systems and we don't understand what's going on. And nonetheless, so much emphasis is put into these systems and they are developed and they are rolled out and used everywhere and we don't know what's going on and the aim is to save money at the harm of people. Yeah? And I'm shocked about that. And I want to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you for, for saying that. I want to just say that I, I don't want to actually demonize a particular community, as I've said, I mean, I, I actually do a lot of work with computer scientists, and what the, some of the most interesting conversations I have are with people who are engaged in trying to understand that, okay, bias is not a computational tweak that you can get out. I mean, like, why after five years of this FATML conference, there's finally a track on science and technology studies or philosophy or social science because people are understanding that we have such different worldviews, different epistemologies, but we have to find a way to start talking together. And so one of the exercises that I'm, I'm proposing is like, you take the same paper and you read it from three different perspectives, you're going to understand something very different. And we need to start being able to talk to each other, but it's going to be really slow. And I mean, I really appreciate what you said, but I also don't want to make it about one group of people because now you see, you know, somebody says, oh, these people are terrible, they need ethics. So let's put a whole bunch of money into training them to do ethics. And the thing is, there's actually a total power asymmetry. Like they're academics who are also broke and also trying to do things, you know? So it's not just about kind of localizing uh, in, in one group, but I really appreciate what you said. And I, I don't think computer scientists are that bad. <laughs> Thanks. My best friends are computer scientists. Yeah. Do we have time for one more question or should we? Okay, sorry, we'll wrap this up. Now join me in a round of applause for our two speakers. So I really would like to thank you for this great presentation, uh, Slava and Maya, and also for the moderation, Nicole. And uh, I just wanted to say that we have another 15 minutes break, and then we will meet again here for the keynote of Charlotte Webb. Uh, and we will also speak about uh, the feminist internet and uh, the discourse of feminism. So I think also this will follow up what you were asking. Thank you, and see you in 15 minutes. And thank you very much.